good afternoon good morning good afternoon good morning can you hear me okay yes please thank you are we ready to start good afternoon welcome to the national grand round on covid-19 being held at the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and this time i am delighted that we're doing it in collaboration with our colleagues at the university college london so it's an international grand round that we're having both from uh, india and from uk we've been having these uh, grand rounds on a regular basis for the past many months and the topics have evolved as has the uh, pandemic so uh, today we are discussing things which would be important with the number of cases coming down and the post covid sequel becoming more and more important and also the issues as far as vaccination is concerned uh, how does it impact the severity of illness so both the impact on infection and on disease and i am very happy that we have a panel both from india and from the us but before i introduce the panel i would really invite uh, dr monica lakhanpal professor of integrated child health and pro pro wise uh, pro south asia ucl london to give her introductory remarks thank you professor galeria um firstly a big thank you to yourself and um professor rajiv kumar as well for inviting us again for the second time to join your rank grand round from ucl um uk um it's always an honor to join you and um we know that our two year partnership it has been about two years now a very solid partnership and many months before that we were also together and so to be here again at this critical time um at during the covid pandemic um is an is just a huge honor to be able to share our expertise our knowledge bilaterally across both countries a, a very important thing for us to be doing globally today the life at ucl has changed a lot we now have a new pro vice provost and um, so a new provost and the new provost is from university of sydney he's just recently taken over um professor michael spence he has a huge interest in india and always has done and so we see our partnership going from strength to strength over the next coming years um i also understand this is the 20th, 20th anniversary um for this grand round as well so we're honored to be part of that and i've started feeling a little bit like your extended family now i think you've got used to seeing me over and over again now and you can't get rid of me once you have me now i'm afraid um so thank you very much um and we have some wonderful speakers from our end and i know you have some wonderful speakers from your end so just to say thank you very much to professor porter dr nair dr denny and professor brown for giving up their time to join us today and we were just saying it's a shame we can't be with you in india um because we've always had been welcomed so well from you and we look forward to through the vaccination program which has been rolled out in india in a tremendous way um and also in the uk to be able to fly over and join you very soon so thank you professor galeria thank you very much and uh, we'll start and i'll it's my honor to really introduce the panelists and the speakers and we've already had uh, Uh, Dr Monica Lakhanpal give her introductory remarks we all know her very well because we had a very good collaboration with UCL thanks to her uh, extraordinary effort and she is a consultant pediatrician at the Wintington Hospital and the pro vice uh, provost for South Asia at UCL so thank you very much among the UK faculty we also have Dr Jeremy Brown he is an academic uh, respiratory consultant with a, a sub specialty uh, interest in lung fibrosis he's also visited uh, aims if i'm not mistaken if you've had interactions with him so i'm glad to see him here and it'll be uh, we'll be delighted to have his comments also we also have dr jona porter head of nhs national interstitial lung disease service at uclh and is professor of respiratory medicine at ucl thank you very much for sparing your time uh, dr arjun nair is a consultant radiologist with a sub specialty interest in cardiothoracic imaging at ucl hospital and an honorary associate professor at university college london thank you very much also for being here and we have dr emma denny a specialist registrar in respiratory medicine with sub specialty interest in interstitial lung disease and a clinical research training fellow at ucl respiratory from the indian side we have dr anant mohan who's professor and head department of pulmonary medicine critical care and sleep medicine at the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi 
And on my left is Dr. Neeraj Nishchal, who's an associate professor of medicine at the All Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Both of them have been very actively involved in our COVID uh, uh, program, COVID ICU, and the COVID setup that we had. So I think we'll have a very interesting presentation and uh, topic discussion. For the audience, I'll just uh, like to add here that uh, you can send us uh, your questions through WhatsApp, the number being 9999692364. It's the same number that we use every time, double nine double nine six nine two three six four. And as usual, we'll start off first with the case presentation. And the first case would be presented by Dr. Pavan Tiwari, who's an assistant professor in pulmonary medicine at the All Institute of uh, Medical Sciences in New Delhi. He will be presenting one of the many cases that we've seen of post-COVID lung fibrosis and interstitial lung disease and uh, the challenges that we have in managing such patients. There is a diverse array of uh, patients who present to us with post-COVID lung fibrosis, some who show a very dramatic improvement and others who continue to have a significant degree of disability as far as lung function and uh, uh, breathlessness is concerned. So over to Dr. Pavan Tiwari for the first case of post-COVID lung fibrosis. Over to you, Dr. Pavan. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, uh, a very good afternoon to all those who have uh, tuned in for this uh, webcast. So I'll be presenting the first case, uh, which is a clinical case discussion of uh, a patient who had post-COVID lung fibrosis and how he fared. We have a follow-up now of almost uh, seven months for this patient. So this gentleman is a 43-year-old uh, gentleman. He is a practitioner of homeopathy. He did not have any comorbidities or any addictions. Uh, his initial presentation was actually with high-grade fever for uh, seven days, and he also had dyspnea, which progressed from mild uh, grade one MMRC to grade four over the last three days before he presented to us. He also had asso associated dry cough. Um, this was his uh, baseline uh, chest x-ray, which was done in the emergency, which showed uh, bilateral middle and lower zone um, uh, infiltrates, and uh, which is quite suggestive of uh, COVID in the current scenario. scenario. And his RT-PCR was tested, which was positive. Now, what happened was over the next few days, he had a worsening of symptoms. So initially when he presented, he had a mild to moderate ARDS by PO2 by FiO2 ratio. But subsequently he had severe ARDS. Uh, he was initiated on HFNC, even with 100% FiO2 and high flows, he did not tolerate HFNC and he was always tachypneic. Uh, so subsequently he was shifted to NIV with uh, a PEEP of around eight to 10 and FiO2 of 80%, we were able to clinically stabilize him. He was started on steroids, low-dose steroids, remdesivir, and uh, DVT, prof uh, DVT prophylaxis initially. But his, uh, as his D-dimer was around uh, 1,000, we started him on therapeutic, do uh, therapeutic dose of deltaparin. His chest X-ray on uh, over the next uh, two days also worsened. Now, subsequently, with time, he uh, this was the baseline chest X-ray, uh, uh, CT chest, which was done, which showed uh, bilateral diffuse infiltrates. GGOs along with air trapping, which is quite suggestive of uh, uh, initial phases of ARDS. Uh, subsequently, he had persistent oxygen requirements. So clinically, he was stabilized, but uh, his oxygen requirement remained persistent. He required admission in ICU for around 19 days. Subsequently, his RT-PCR became negative. But even at this time, he required around uh, 40 to 50% FiO2 to, to maintain his saturation. And he had uh, dyspnea and desaturation even on mild minimal exertion. Um, so after his RT-PCR became negative, he was shifted to a post-COVID uh, HDU setting. Now at this time, uh, he did not have any evidence of cytokine release syndrome over the last weeks or even at uh, when his RT-PCR became negative. So we continued treatment with dexamethasone 6 mg once a day and low molecular weight heparin in uh, therapeutic doses. Uh, we could aggressively give him pulmonary rehabilitation once we, uh, which became easier once he came to uh, non-COVID area. His oxygen requirement gradually reduced to around two to three liters per, uh, per liter over the next four weeks, uh, though he still had significant desaturation on uh, minimal exertion at this time. So uh, around uh, week six to eight of illness, he continued to have this dyspnea on minimal exertion. He, has a, he had a saturation of around 78% of room air. He required low flow oxygen. Uh, 
his inflammatory markers were not significantly elevated, but his D-dimer continued to be persistently elevated. So one of the causes thought of was uh, actually pulmonary embolism and his uh, CT with CTPA was done again, which was normal. At this time, his uh, six minute uh, walk distance was around 220 meters uh, with supplemental oxygen of around four liters. Uh, though he used to desaturate uh, even uh, during the six minute walk test, he desaturated up to 78% even while being on supplemental oxygen. Uh, now, this was the ch uh, chest CT, which was repeated on uh, week 8, which showed actually uh, uh, significant uh, areas of uh, interlobular septal thickening along with uh, GGOs and areas which uh, conform to uh, organizing pneumonia pattern. And the non-dependent areas actually showed kind of air trapping, which uh, is uh, uh, which we know is a sequelae of uh, ARDS. So he had at this point in time at week 8 of his illness, he had evidence of post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis along with these GGOs and changes of organizing pneumonia. So at this point in time, uh, uh, we could discharge the patient. He was discharged on river oxaban uh, as he had elevated D-dimer, though he never had uh, uh, documented DVT or pulmonary embolism. Uh, we continued low-dose steroids. Uh, he was shifted to prednisolone 20 milligram once a day, which was gradually tapered to 5 milligram OD over the next six weeks. And... We also added perfenidone at this time, which was initiated at a dose of 400 milligrams thrice a day, which we escalated over the next six weeks to the optimal dose. And we continued him on pulmonary rehabilitation, but he was taught home-based pulmonary rehabilitation regimen. Now, over the, uh, over the last uh, four months, what has happened, this was the baseline when we discharged him. At this point, he, his six-minute walk distance was around 220 meters. He desaturated to around 78%, even, even while he did this on supplemental oxygen. Uh, the FVC at this time was around 45%, and he had significant dyspnea. After two months of follow-up, uh, and at six months, we can see that there was gradual improvement in his six-minute walk distance. His baseline uh, or his uh, uh, lowest uh, saturation while uh, doing the six-minute walk test also improved. And his dyspnea scale has have also improved. So at six months of follow-up, now he has resumed near normal activities. Uh, so this is the radiology at the end of six months. We see that on chest X-ray, there is significant radio radiologic clearance, though on the follow-up CT, we see that the lower zones are predominantly clear, except for uh, the traction, bronchiectasis, and fibrotic changes that are there. And the upper zones also show resolving uh, uh, changes along with uh, some residual fibrosis. Uh, so current status is that we have stopped his systemic steroids in uh, rivaroxaban. He has been continuing on re rehabilitation exercises at home. And he has joined back work, uh, though he has some fatigability, but he's uh, able to uh, go around his daily activities and professional activities. And we now follow, uh, we plan a repeat assessment after three months. So I'll end, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting case. And I think it highlights a few points. One, of course, being that these uh, patients do show a gradual recovery. And sometimes it takes even more than three months for the lung function to improve and the radiological uh, picture to cl uh, clear up. And we've had uh, many such patients. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I had a patient who was in the ICU for more than three months on high flow nasal cannula. And it took almost uh, about four to five months to get him off. He's still on home oxygen, but from HFNC, he has now come down to only one to two liters with aggressive pulmonary rehabilitation. So, but there have been other patients who actually have been even had a worse course and have been even considered for lung transplant because of the extensive fibrosis in the lungs. So it's a very variable picture, but uh, luckily this patient did well and uh, uh, was able to really uh, have a good quality of life. Uh, we'll take the questions at the end. Um, if uh, Dr. Anand Moni wanted to add anything about this case or in general. Okay, so we'll go on to the second case, which is uh, uh, on the use of steroids including extended use to prevent ILD, which is something that uh, is a hot topic, steroids versus antifibrotics, and how long to give steroids uh, in these patients. So we have the second case, which will be presented by the University College London by Dr. Joanna Porter, Dr. Arjun Nair, Dr. Ima Denene. And uh, over to you for the second case. Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Galerio. And we'd like on behalf of, of um, our group just to thank you so much and uh, Professor Kumar for the invitation and for arranging uh, this, this meeting. Fascinating case by Dr. Tiwari we've just heard. And I think it emphasizes the differences 
Um, I, I know in India, you've been using a lot of antifibrotics and a lot of steroids from the very beginning. Uh, in the UK, that wasn't the case. We only introduced dexamethasone to patients with hypoxic COVID pneumonitis uh, in July when the results of the recovery trial were made, were made known. So, um, and Emma, you might want to go on to the next slide because um, there's a lot of discussion in the UK about the use of steroids in COVID pneumonia. And in particular, these three questions. So, so many of our patients who come in requiring oxygen will receive dexamethasone, six milligrams uh, for 10 days as per the recovery trial uh, um, protocol. And the question we have in many of these patients is, is should we uh, extend that steroid treatment? If patients are sent home, they stop the dexamethasone. So they may only have it for two or three days despite significant hypoxic insults. So should that be extended in some patients? Uh, then there's another group actually who progressed despite inpatient steroid treatment. And the question is, should we augment steroid treatment in those patients? What's the evidence for that? Uh, and then of course, are the patients that we discharge who come back to us um, after a significant delay presenting with uh, an inflammatory interstitial lung disease. And again, another, the third question we have is what is the role of steroids in these patients? So we're just going to emphasize, we're, I'm afraid instead of one, we've, we've actually got three cases, but we're going to go through them very quickly, uh, where we um, considered uh, steroids at these three different time points. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to uh, Emma Dineni now for the cases. Okay. Um, so the first case is a 63-year-old Caucasian female with a background of rheumatoid arthritis and lupus overlap for which she received rituximab therapy and she'd last had, had a dose of this in October 2020. Um, she didn't have any known pre-existing lung disease in relation to her rheumatoid. She'd also had previous jo multiple joint replacements, um, osteoarthritis and hypertension. She was a never smoker and fully independent at home. Um, so she first tested positive for COVID-19 in the community at the end of December and she presented to hospital seven days later with cough, breathlessness, fever, myalgia, and fatigue. At this point, her oxygen saturations were 94% on room air. Her CRP wasn't particularly exciting at 7.4, and her other bloods were unremarkable, and her chest X-ray was relatively clear, so she was discharged home. She represented four days later with worsening breathlessness and an, an oxygen requirement as her, ox as her oxygen saturations were now 90% on room air. Her inflammatory markers were increasing a little bit, CRP now 26, and she was lymphopenic. And her chest x-ray was relatively similar to the previous one on the 2nd of January. So she was admitted and started on dexamethasone 6 milligrams daily. Um, she started treatment, um, had a CTPA on the 9th, just to exclude any pulmonary emboli. Um, and this did, there was no PEs, but she did have some bilateral patchy consolidation. After 10 days, she completed the treatment and her, oxygen, her oxygenation was improving. This was weaned down and her inflammatory markers were improving. Um, and it was all looking good. But four days later, after stopping the dexamethasone, she deteriorated again and her inflammatory markers increased. Her CRP was now 200 and she was lymphopenic again. Her ferritin was 1,900 from 400 baseline. She was started, and started on antibiotics and her ventilatory requirements increased as well. So she required CPAP at this stage. A couple of days later, her imaging, she had another CT, her imaging was worse and she was restarted on dexamethasone at six milligrams and she was transferred to intensive care for monitoring at this stage. Um, into the, a couple of days into the dexamethasone treatment, she was improving. Her inflammatory markers were reducing, her ventilatory requirements were reducing and she was switched to high flow nasal oxygen. And she completed her 10 days on the 4th of dexamethasone on the 4th of February. However, three days later, she deteriorated again with increasing oxygen requirements and was restarted on CPAP. At this stage, other infection was in excluded, for example, PCP. And her case was discussed with the interstitial lung disease team. And the imaging at this stage, which Arjun will show in the next few slides, it was felt to be consistent with a progressive fibrotic organizing pneumonia. And the initial response to the steroids had not been maintained. And each time she deteriorated, it seemed to coincide with the weaning of the dexamethasone. So we felt at this stage it'd be reasonable to reinstate the steroids at a higher dose. Um, so she was started on 33 milligrams and given this to three days, followed by 20 milligrams to three days, followed by 13.2 milligrams to three days, and then 6.6 .6 milligrams to three days.
And then after this, she was switched to prednisolone and she remains an inpatient on a weaning course of prednisolone. She's now back on the ward. She's on nasal flow oxygen and she's rehabilitating well. So I'll just pass you over to Arjun for the imaging. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, we thought we'd do the imaging uh, in a bulk so that it was easier to illustrate the um, evolution of the changes. So you can see just approximately five to seven days post her PCR positivity. Um, the patient had hardly any radiographically detectable changes uh, at the top left there. Um, and um, a few days later, four days from, from then, even then she only had about uh, uh, you know, very mild uh, to moderate uh, disease on the radiograph. Uh, you would class that as a Wong scale of uh, two or three if you're using that, um, which we know has a correlation with um, prognosis as well, uh, with the severe deterioration that you've all uh, already uh, seen uh, by the 23rd of January uh, and a subsequent slight improvement uh, by the 30th. Um, next slide, please, Emma. Thank you. Uh, and again, the, the pattern you're familiar with there is somebody who um, looks like they're losing volume, uh, especially uh, between the 6th and uh, 20th of February. So now we're well into the cause of the illness. I think we're, we're pretty much into about seven weeks or so. And this is just to illustrate, uh, as we'll see on the next slides, how difficult it can be uh, in the, these patients uh, to, un, uh, to estimate the volume, volume loss on these patients. But um, actually, uh, the radiographic progression is essential to understand the evolution, I think, from all the, you know, what we will see was an organizing pneumonia pattern to perhaps more of a diffuse alveolar damage pattern. Uh, next slide, please, Emma. So as Emma said earlier, very, very early on in the cause of the disease, approximately seven days post, uh, there was a CT pulmonary angiogram. And just as a, a technical note, we, we perform these with uh, pre-contrast and post-contrast CT uh, in, in a subtraction CT uh, protocol, just so that we don't overestimate the amount of ground glass uh, um, which can happen on a just purely post-contrast scan. And the images you see there on the right are perfusion maps of the lung, uh, which we don't use for diagnostic purposes. But I, I put in here just to illustrate the point that there can be quite patchy perfusion, which again speaks to the vasculopathy or vascular plegia that you can see uh, in this uh, fascinating uh, virus. Uh, and, and the images there on the left, um, you can see in the top middle there, a lovely uh, illustration of the reverse halo sign, which we recognize as part of organizing pneumonia in a predominantly bronchocentric distribution. So the disease pattern at this stage, um, you know, very early on, was one of essentially an organizing pneumonia. I'd hesitate to call this fibrosis at this point, uh, but on the next slide, um, if you don't mind, Emma. And the next slide you see compared to uh, that first CT on the left there, on the CT on the right now shows more diffuse ground glass opacity. Again, yeah, uh, this was borne out in the pre and post contrast imaging uh, with a craniochordal gradient uh, and a dorsal ventral gradient as well. So again, more suspicious now for a more, more diffuse other damage process. And especially if you look at the upper lobe images there, the top two images there in the, on that top row, you'll see that what was happening, it appears is that bronchocentric pattern was giving way, was actually melting away over the course of uh, three weeks or so into this more diffuse uh, parenchymal abnormality. So almost one, it almost makes you wonder if a different process was taking over at this point, uh, which of course led to the discussions we had about excluding immunocompromised, uh, sorry, opportunistic infections such as PCP or even pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, but by, by a month later, you can now see that the, diffuse, the ground glass, although still very diffuse, is dissipating. But in its place, we are starting to see that very, uh, very worrying sign of sort of varicose dilatation of the airways as well, uh, especially in that left upper lobe. Um, next slide, please, Emma. And I've just put in these some um, sagittal reconstructions here to show you that, especially on the sagittal uh, images, you can see, yes, the increasing density uh, with the craniochordal and dorsal ventral gradients, but also the marked volume loss as evidenced by the uh, movement of the fissure or the left oblique fissure downwards. And also, again, that alarming sign of non tapering. Um, varicose dilatation of the airways, again, suggestive of fibrosis. And I would always only mention that as a worrying sign of fibrosis in the context of a patient who's not intubated, who's not on uh, intuba uh, intubation-induced uh, positive pressure ventilation, because otherwise, as we'll see in some other cases, we can't overestimate the, what we think is fibrosis. Uh, and uh, next slide, finally. Thank you. And just again, just to show the perfusion maps between the CTPAs, uh, that, uh, especially in that last scan, where we still have quite a lot of diffuse, um, what looks like fibrotic abnormality now, even aligned for the same similar amounts of uh, uh, contrast in the pulmonary arteries, there is what appears to be oligemia now of the lungs. So perhaps that may, may illustrate a pulmonary vascular resistance component as well, which I'm sure will, will be a fascinating point to discuss later on. Okay, thanks, Arjun. 
So the next case is a 72-year-old Caucasian male with a background of atrial fibrillation, hypertension, high cholesterol. He takes a DOAC, Ramipril and Statin as his regular medications. He's an ex-social smoker and he had a pretty good uh, pre-morbid fitness level running, running five kilo kilometers at least three times a week. So he first developed symptoms in the middle of March last year, a fever, myalgia and headache. He was managing okay at home and then had a test seven days later, which was a positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, he continued to manage okay at home, but at day 14, he presented to the emergency department with ongoing fevers. He denied feeling particularly breathless at this stage, but his oxygen saturations were 85 to 86% on room air. His inflammatory markers were increased, CRP of 157 and a ferritin of 1700, and he was admitted. He responded very well to high flow nasal oxygen and antibiotics. Um, he remained in hospital for eight days in total, at, at, which, at the end of which his oxygen saturations were 92% on room air and he was discharged home. Um, one week post discharge, he represented um, to the um, AMU with a, uh, ongoing breathlessness. Um, he had a CTPA at this stage, which excluded a pulmonary emboli, but did show an organised pneumonia. Um, and there was some traction bronchiectasis on this, suggestive of some early fibrosis. He had had a previously normal CT in February 2019. Um, so he had a bronchoscopy. I'll show you the results of that on the next slide. But he had a significant lymphocyte, lymphocyte, lymph lymphocytosis and raises in aphilia. Um, he was started on oral prednisolone at 30 milligrams and took this for several days. Um, one week, let, one week later, he was getting a little bit better. He was still breathless and he was seen again in ambulatory care. At this stage, it was decided to give him some pulsed IV methylprednisolone. And he was given this over three weeks, 750 milligrams in the first week, 500 milligrams at week two, and, and a further 500 milligrams at week three. And once he completed the IV methylprednisolone, this was followed up with some more oral prednisolone, 20 milligrams, which was weaned over two weeks. At the end of treatment, he had a PET CT scan, which Arjun will show on the next slide, and this showed marked improvement compared to his previous scan. Um, there's the results of the bronchoscopy, um, the, the cell differential from the lavage. Um, he also had a negative autoimmune screen, and his lung function towards the end of May was also preserved with spirometry and gas transfer. Um, and a year later, he's much, much better. He's back to his normal exercise tolerance. In fact, it's increased a little, and he's now running at least 10 kilometers a day. Thanks, Emma. Um, so again, the radiographic progression uh, in this case over just over two weeks was uh, quite alarming. As you can see, it already looked uh, you know, uh, quite severe. I'd say about 75% of the lung involved by the 1st of April. Uh, and, and that looked uh, like there was increasing density and extent uh, on, the, on the chest radiograph of the 16th of April. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and just for reference that we put in a, a CT scan uh, that the patient had had um, about a year uh, previously, which was essentially normal. And then in the middle there, you can see the CT scan done about uh, at the same time as that worsening a chest radiograph, which showed marked bronchocentric uh, consolidation again um, with um, what looks like there. And I'll, I've got a zoomed up uh, image of it in a couple of slides. Uh, where, where the airways look a bit di dilated as well. But as, as you see, corresponding to the improving lung function uh, by the 20th of May, the disease looks like it's um, in almost increased in extent, given that, so if you were scoring extent alone, you might say actually the ground glass is worse. Um, but to me, this is actually looks like almost, if you like, fibrotic ice melting in the way we, we think about it. Uh, and it looks like now you're in puddles of, of ground glass. What those puddles are made of, though, the inflammatory infiltrate, if you say, uh, if, if we, we want about that is it's still uh, you know up for debate and differs between patient to patient. Uh, next slide, please. And again, just as, just to illustrate the upper and lower appearances here. Again, very dense bronchocentric consolidation. Again, you might be forgiven for thinking there's some you know distortion of the airways in those earlier CTs, but starting to, to really melt away uh, by that next CT only approximately a month later. Uh, but the distribution, again, the extent again looks slightly worse uh, and. Uh, Next slide, Emma. This will be the hopefully the zoomed up appearances. Yeah, just to show you again that what we think is traction of uh, bronchiectasis, that what we you know or alarming signs of fibrosis in an earlier scan. I think we overestimate uh, even as early as uh, uh, 
uh, as, especially in the early stage, because as we know, there'll be some fibroproliferation and this starts to uh, almost reverse uh, on, the, on the CT scans. It takes longer in many cases, but we are seeing this in this case, especially rather early, a return of the airways to normal. Um, and the final slide for this case, Emma. Thank you. And that's just a PET CT again done uh, at the time of that improving lung function, where uh, which which and the ILD team actually use uh, find very reassuring in this case because you can see if anything there's only a little bit of FDG uptake. It was in the SUV max regions of about less than three, indicating very low to almost no uh, in uh, in a residual uh, FDG activity there. Uh, in other words, not very uh, hot and inflammatory, but still obviously some some dependent ground glass there. So perhaps the radiology will lag behind the clinical and physiological improvement. And that's the most recent chest radiograph, um, which essentially has shown quite a lot of improvement there. And um, obviously at this stage, we have not elected to do a CT. Sometimes you, perhaps it's, it's good to not look too hard if the patient is improving. Thanks, Arjun. So the third and final case is a 44 year old Asian male with no medical history, not on any regular medications, never smoked, no alcohol, fully independent and in full-time work in retail prior to his admission. Um, he first developed symptoms in early April last year and presented very unwell to our emergency department four days later with fevers and breathlessness. His oxygen saturations were 81% on room air when he first presented. He was febrile and he was hypertensive. His inflammatory markers were raised with a CRP of 336 and he was lymphopenic. His ferritin was just over four and a half thousand. So he was started on CPAP in the emergency department and then transferred to intensive care the following day because of increasing ventilatory requirements and was later intubated and ven ventilated on that same day. We actually struggled to get a positive COVID test from his nose and throat swab, but eventually about approximately a week later, his sputum was positive for SARS-CoV-2. He was mechanically ventilated for 34 days from the 13th of April to the 16th of May. It was a complicated admission. He had a STEMI on the 23rd of April, which required thrombolysis. And because of increasing oxygen requirements towards the end of April, he was discussed with our local ECMO centre. Um, and following a CT scan, which they required as part of, the anal uh, part of assessing his case, they decided there was some evidence of fibrosis on the scan and they declined him for ECMO. But following that, he was given two pulses of IV methylprednisolone, 750 milligrams and 500 milligrams, and then slowly made a gradual improvement um, and was extubated 18 days later. Um, he was stepped down to the ward. He had an intensive rehabilitation programme and his oxygen was slowly weaned um, and he was discharged on the 12th of June. Um, at his follow-up at seven weeks, um, he was still breathless and had an oxygen monitor at home and was reporting episodes of desaturation. So a decision was made to start him on oral prednisolone, 30 milligrams, and this was weaned over the following six weeks. He had some lung function at the end of last year, which shows relatively preserved spirometry with re reduced gas transfer. And then his imaging, which Arjun will go through, but the most latest scan in February of this year, it's looking, it's improved, but fairly static. And I'll pass over to Arjun now. Thanks, Emma. Um, so again, that very uh, now characteristic peripheral uh, slightly mid to lower zone predominant uh, increased airspace opacity on the uh, presentation radiograph. Uh, and just for comparison, they're a markedly different radiograph with diffuse airspace opacification, obviously, uh, with all the um, uh, intubation and uh, support lines in place as well by this stage, with an increasing uh, craniocaudal gradient as well there, but complicated by perhaps some pleural effusions uh, on this mobile film. Um, so uh, on to the CTs now. Uh, next slide, please, Emma. Thank you. So I've just illustrated uh, four, four um, CTs here. So the first uh, CT on the top left there, uh, just pointing out that that was prone, done prone because the patient uh, was was being um, ventilated prone at this stage uh, for, for, for obviously to, to as, as we all know, to improve um, ventilatory um, their, their ventilatory uh, outcomes, but um, this is approximately 18 days after presentation um, and also uh, three days after their uh, uh, myocardial infarction. So as you can see, it's quite difficult to interpret the, the changes there, but um, there is quite dense opacification. And the airways, although appearing slightly dilated, we must remember that in the context of a patient receiving positive airway pressure, I would be very hesitant and all thoracic readers would be very hesitant to call that fibrosis. And in fact, as you've heard from Emma, it is as 
uh, at best misleading, uh, at worst probably even dangerous because it can lead to uh, differences in management. Um, anyway, uh, a month later, of course, you see that uh, on, the, on the supine scan that there's dense consolidation, perhaps still a lot of uh, reticulation and, and ground glass. Um, and by June, that starts to markedly improve. Uh, the pleural effusions have, of course, all uh, resolved as well, probably an element of post-cardiac uh, insult heart failure. Um, but there's still a little bit of parenchymal distortion here. And by September, as I as said, there's very little uh, interstitial abnormality there. It's not normal, of course. There's still some areas of increased density, but as I, I would hesitate to call that, uh, well, I definitely would not call it fibrosis, and I would probably at most call it in, in, an interstitial abnormality only. Uh, and again, this is, you know, only about uh, four, four to five months after their, their presentation and acute event. Uh, and the next slide, please, Emma. Um, again, just to show you that the basal uh, changes again uh, for this patient where it looked like uh, there's perhaps even more evidence of airway distortion uh, on those top two scans, but a mark, marked improvement in both the lung volume and parenchymal distortion by September. And uh, the next one, please, Emma. Thank you. And as Emma was saying, the latest scan, uh, which are the uh, two images on the right there from February uh, compared to September, now show what looks like essentially static appearances. Uh, there are probably slight differences in lung density, which are probably accounted for by technique and by inspir inspiratory le uh, level. Um, but the airways are, if anything, hardly uh, distorted at this stage. And we do know from uh, previous uh, longer term follow up of uh, initial uh, SARS uh, patients and MERS patients as well that the quite a few of these patients, uh, if we scan them over longer time points, two years or so, will probably improve at, at this level of gain. So again, another, perhaps another evidence of uh, improvement uh, lagging uh, on radiographs, lagging behind uh, clinical improvement, though the patient is still uh, still not quite up to up to normal yet. And the, the final thing uh, to, to say here is, I think, um, in, sorry, <laughs> just to say that we still don't know what the increased density uh, is uh, in, in those lungs there. Why is it static? Could it be an inflammatory infiltration? this long uh, post the acute event. Joe? Yeah. Thank you. So just to say, our, I mean, I think these sort of illustrate some of the cases that we've been seeing at UCLH. And we were a bit slow um, with the dexma dexamethasone uh, introduction at the beginning of the pandemic. Overall, actually, looking at our first wave where patients didn't routinely get dexamethasone, we're seeing about 6% of patients that have interstitial abnormalities or, or um, true interstitial lung disease. Uh, what's interesting, actually, two of these probably had pre-existing ILD, which is, of course, difficult because lots of patients um, haven't necessarily had CT scans. So I would say, and there'll be plenty of time for discussion, but my gut reaction is that we probably should have been starting steroids earlier and we should, um, at UCLH now, think about extending duration of steroid treatment if patients are stuck. Uh, we are awaiting further evidence from um, an MRC-funded UKRI project, which is looking at the instance of ILD in a large cohort, uh, 12,000 patients, both hospitalized and community patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for these interesting cases and really highlighting the type of changes that we tend to see as far as uh, COVID is concerned and really Putting in context what I've always argued, the so-called fibrotic changes in the lung, because by definition, fibrotic would mean that it's irreversible, but that's not true. And this is something we see even in the past. I've had this argument with my radiologist many years ago, because even in the NSIP pattern that you see for a large number of ILDs, which has an NSIP, which is not a UIP pattern, they would say this is fibrotic, it's irreversible. But often on follow-up with steroids, they would really show significant decrease, especially if it was a CTD-related ILD. So I think it's important to remember that when we label these as fibrotics, we must put that with the writer that they may reverse and they may change, and that's something to keep in mind. The second point that you raised, I think, is also very, very important, and that is the early use of steroids. We at, uh, in India had started using steroids early, uh, mm -hmm. even before the, the recovery trial. Mm -hmm. And I've had this argument with the a group of a family whom I was following up and treating for COVID who were in the UK. They were actually in London and uh, uh, on the 10th day of uh, coming out of COVID, they started having fever, the, eye, the inflammatory markers were high, 
They got a CT scan done, which showed infiltrates, but the sat saturation was being maintained. And therefore they were advised against steroids because it was only if your saturation fell that you'd needed steroids. Mm. And I had this big discussion with a friend of mine, Mike Polkey at the Brompton and uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Hind, who had a, con a consultation with them and they were not willing to start steroids. Ultimately, I convinced the patient to take steroids and the patient has done well, both the family has done well, they're back in India. But uh, I think uh, that lesson is there that in some patients, especially when you, when you come out of viremia and you're having now more of an inflammatory response, then anti-inflammatory will actually be more useful. And maybe that's what the recovery trial showed that those who were having that inflammatory part because they were given steroids in the later part of the illness. When the viremia had come down, inflammation was high and probably that's why steroids worked when your saturation was falling. Mm -hmm. So I think the fall mm -hmm. in saturation, saturation was more like a surrogate marker for decrease, increasing inflammation. And we should look at the whole picture rather than just looking at saturation. So if you have a person whose saturation is not that much, let's say 97, but inflammatory markers are high, it's a seven, 10 day, the patient's having fever, it may be worthwhile to consider steroids rather than just wait for the SAT to fall. But thank you very much. And we'll have a detailed discussion once we go on after the topic presentation. For the audience, I'll just like to remind you that if you have any questions and we have already got a number of them, that please send your uh, questions through WhatsApp the number is 9999692364. I'll repeat that, 9999692364. We'll go on to the topic uh, presentation. And the first topic is uh, post-COVID-19 lung fibrosis, which actually follows from the cases that have been presented. And this will, topic will be discussed by Dr. Neeraj Nishchal, who's an associate professor of medicine at the All Institute of Medical Sciences. Over to you, Dr. Neeraj. Thank you, sir, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, in next 10-15 minutes, I will be discussing lung complications of COVID, including lung fibrosis aspect. So it has been almost one year since uh, this COVID-19 was declared as a pandemic. That was March 2020. And now we have millions of people across the world who have been infected by this uh, particular virus. So although majority of cases are asymptomatic or mild, but 20% uh, of cases require hospitalization and about 5% become critically ill. So considering the number of cases that have uh, been involved, even this 5% becomes a significant number. So these severely and critically ill patients are prone to develop several early or late complications, which could be both pulmonary and extra pulmonary. Considering the scale of pandemic, huge number of people will be affected as a consequence of development of such complications. So we have to be very careful while assessing all these patients. Even if we are able to control this pandemic, management of these complications is going to be the next major challenge uh, before us. So what are the common complications of COVID-19? It could be pulmonary complications or extra pulmonary complications. Uh, pulmonary complications could be parenchymal, airway, pleural, or vascular. It could be early or a late complication depending on the uh, time of onset of these complications. So to understand the pulmonary complications, we should uh, revisit the pathophysiology. And uh, it, it's not a single step, but a, uh, an event of multiple steps but the center of all these steps include uh, virally activated pathway. So the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, activates pathways which may be deleterious to various aspects of the body defense system uh, against any sort of complication. So uh, this virally activated pathway may lead to cellular injury and inflammation. And of course, when a patient gets sick, is not able to maintain uh, saturation level, then again, uh, these patients require uh, support, which could be non-invasive ventilation or mechanical ventilation, which may further accentuate the uh, problem to these patients, the uh, damage to these uh, patients. And depending on whether this damage was controlled or not, or uh, the outcome will depend on the, uh, those aspects. So uh, if we see this uh, virus entry into the respiratory, respiratory epithelium lead to decreased ACE2 and uh, uh, dysregulation of uh, RAS system. And this viral entry alters the growth factor production, receptor expression and uh, promotes the fi uh, pro-fibrotic pathway. So further translation and replication of this uh, virus in the host cell disrupts and inhibits the whole uh, host protein translation, which can lead to inhibition and off repair mechanism leading to various complications like fibrosis. Uh, 
Furthermore, the virus release will lead to cytoskeletal rearrangements, uh, and this leads to fibroblast activation and other pro-fibrotic uh, pathways downstream uh, effects. The epithelial, endothelial, and macrophage cell injury and cell death causes increased vascular, vascular permeability, leading to various dysfunction and fluid accumulation, a uh, hallmark of uh, the ARDS development uh, in such patients. Inflammation-induced injury and uh, reactive oxygen species generation contributes to ARDS in such patients. And again, once we start uh, giving mechanical ventilation uh, to these patients, uh, leading to barotrauma, volume, uh, volume trauma, or biotrauma, which contributes further to the pro-fibrotic uh, pro mechanisms such as inflammation, epithelial mesenchymal transitions, and activation of pro-fibrotic uh, pathways. So if uh, all these factors, viral clearance, wound rehealing resolution happens, then uh, the uh, patient recovers completely. And if uh, there is lasting respiratory symptoms uh, leading to a decreased lung function, so a patient may have a stable or a progressive fibrosis depending on the overall outcome. So the early parenchymal complications which we encounter in such patients uh, include ARDS uh, and this critical disease is seen in about 5% uh, of cases. The novel features of this ARDS in COVID-19 uh, is that there is a wide discrepancy between lung compliance and shunt fraction. In early stages, there could be hypoxic vasoconstriction leading to uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch and this seems to be predominant reason for desaturation, desaturation in early part of disease. There is high prevalence of vasculopathy, embolism, microembolism, and pulmonary infarcts in such patients. This is associated with poor outcomes and predisposed to long-term complications like pulmonary fibrosis, tracts and bronch bronchiectasis, as we saw in the previous case presented, recurrent uh, pulmonary infections, and similar other complications. So if we closely look at the pathophysiology of the uh, ARDS in such patients, then once the virus infects uh, the bronchial epithelial cells, and other uh, pneumocytes, and including capillary endothelial cells, the, uh, there is an inflammatory response. And once this virus uh, is released from these cells, then they further enhances the cytokine uh, uh, mediated inflammatory response, which will again, this in continued inflammatory response results in alve alveolar interstitial thickening, increased vascular permeability, and edema. So all these factors will further lead to activation of coagulation pathway leading to a microthrombus uh, formation, which may lead to pulmonary thrombus, thereby completing the complete cycle of the ARDS. So uh, when to suspect a patient might be lining up into ARDS, a post patient will become further tachypneic, dysneic. There will be retraction, chest retraction. Patient will become hy uh, hypoxic. Patient may have tachycardia, there may be evidence of decreased pulmonary compliance. In uh, ABG will so, uh, show decreased uh, PO2. And patient will have increased respiratory effort requiring increased oxygen and PEEP requirement. All these markers, uh, and of course the uh, X-ray and other imaging parameters will further uh, support the uh, finding uh, that we, uh, the patient is going into ARDS. So for managing this uh, ARDS again, there have lot been uh, there has been a lot of controversy whether we should intubate this patient at the early stage, whether we should wait. So again, uh, as uh, I had discussed previously, the initial part of hypoxemia is basically because of ventilation perfusion mismatch because of the vasoplesia. This leads to vigorous inspiratory effort by the patient, leading to uh, uh, volume-induced uh, uh, lung injury, which can, which is also known as patient-related self-inflicted lung injury. So this is the time if we intervene and prevent this hypoxemia from developing uh, further, then we can possibly uh, uh, prevent this patient from landing up into ARDS. If we are not able to do that, then of course uh, this uh, patient-related lung injury is going uh, will lead to vessel stretch increased edema, and with that, the compliance and the ventilatory, uh, 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 the ventilatory effort of the lungs will, is going to decrease, further accentuate the hypoxemia. So if patient, we follow a patient closely and we see the first sign of hypoxemia, then we should ensure that uh, the oxygen saturation in, is increased. Uh, and if we are able to do that, uh, then intubation may be uh, avoided. But if we are not able to do that, then of course, uh, intubation, we should not be delaying intubation too late. Uh, 
to a point where there is no uh, point of no return sort of things so rigorous monitoring and timely intervention is the key in managing such patients so depending on that uh, you have to take a call whether the patient require early intubation so if a patient is requiring early intubation the uh, ideally low peep uh, should be used but again if we leave it for a uh, uh, later stage then then patient may be requiring higher peep so once uh, ARDS sets in, we should uh, be managing patient as per ARDS net protocol. These patients are prone to secondary infections. And in fact, uh, this could be one of the reasons why we are not able to save these patients uh, if uh, this patient develops these secondary infections, especially in ICU care settings. So bacterial and fungal infection lead to increased need for intensive care and increased mortality. Uh, from our previous uh, experience from H1N1 pandemic of 2009, uh, we have seen that about 25% of cases may have uh, developed a secondary infection. But uh, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, uh, this aspect has been inadequately investigated so far. Uh, but there are some uh, uh, publications which have reported up to 50% of non-survivors had some sort of secondary infections. So this has led to empirical use of broad spectrum antibiotics and uh, can be seen in as high as 94 to 100% of severe cases, irrespective of uh, successful identification of an organism. So this study, uh, which was published, uh, it has shown that uh, uh, these uh, non-survivors had higher chances of having infections. However, the antibiotic uses have been uniform across the, uh, these two groups. Then this uh, COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis, though not an uh, uh, entity described from our country so far, but uh, increasing number of reports have been uh, uh, seen from uh, across the globe. And uh, uh, based on the uh, way of identifying this particular infection, it can be labeled as possible, probable, and uh, proven uh, COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis. The treatment remains voriconazole uh, as the first line of treatment. Again, this is an emerging topic and uh, we have to further uh, actively look for such type of infection before saying key, it is more uh, related to COVID only patients or it's just a general uh, presentation in any ICU care settings. Then there could be late parenchyme uh, complications. Uh, this post ARDS fibrosis uh, can happen uh, due to other causes as well. And we have seen that uh, in autopsy findings, 4% to 61% uh, depending on the duration of disease, patient may have uh, post-ARDS fibrosis. Among survivors, normal or near-normal volumetric and spirometric test results occurs by five years with minimal residual changes on imaging. In post-influenza ARDS, uh, of course, pulmonary function improves over time. And in some studies, mild diffusion abnormalities persist in such patients. Even in post-SARS ARDS, approximately 20% patients had radiological abnormality, but spirometric abnormality was found less, in less than 4% at time uh, of one year follow-up. In post-COVID fibrosis, again, different aspects have been reported, uh, mainly from uh, China and Europe. And uh, the patient usually uh, complained of dyspnea, chest pain, and cough. And those uh, patients may have abnormal pulmonary function test and uh, radiological abnormalities. They may have uh, abnormalities in DLCO and uh, total lung capacity and other aspects. But uh, more, most of these studies have shown that these uh, fibrosis are non-progressive and may uh, improve over a period of time. So this post ARDS fibrosis uh, due to infection versus other causes uh, depends on the timing, etiology, prognosis, and mechanistic underpinning of post-viral scarring. And these are different from other chronic interstitial lung disease. IPF and similarly other uh, fibrosis uh, related to autoimmune disorders is usually progressive and eventually fatal in most of the patients. However, uh, this type of progressive fibrosis is not commonly seen in ARDS related to any respiratory infections and or any viral pneumonia. In COVID-19 related uh, ARDS fibrosis, we can see enhanced microthrombi, endothelial dysfunction, and vascular involvement uh, because of these microthrombi. Uh, so if we look closely to the fibrogenic mechanisms, uh, this COVID-19 related fibrosis, again, viral activation of pro-fibrotic uh, pathway remains the main, uh, mainstay of this particular complication. This leads to altered uh, RAS balance Innovating the host translation and altered cell cycle leading to activation of growth factors and cytoskeletal rearrangement. Uh, 
the virus may have direct cellular injury uh, to the type 2 alveolar epithelial cells macrophages and endothelial cells cytokine induced injury leading to inappropriate overexpression of pro inflammatory cytokines again can be an important factor mechanical injury because of ventilator or high flow uh, nasal uh, support, uh, oxygen support can further complicate the situation and of course age is an independent factor for developing a fibrotic response in such patients so risk factors for post covid fibrosis include advanced age severe disease prolonged icu stay or mechanical ventilation underlying lung disease comorbidities including hypertension diabetes and coronary artery disease and lab findings like lymphopenia leukocytosis and elevated ldh have also been postulated as risk factor for developing uh, covid related fibrosis so when a patient has persistent cough persistent chest pain persistent dyspnea and especially in patients who had a severe covid 19 disease one should suspect that covid fibrosis has persisted or is progressing so if we look at the natural history of this post covid fibrosis most of these cases will improve over time some may have static uh, history natural course of progression and uh, progressive disease is uh, something which we have to be very careful while deciding whether this progression is because of the covid-19 uh, fibrosis or the patient had previous undiagnosed ild which have been uh, picked up because we have been screening these patients or could just be because that covid-19 has caused a hit because of is the patient who was susceptible for developing this ild has now started manifesting this particular disease this is something which needs uh, to be further investigated so uh, treat uh, the management of fibro uh, this uh, post covid 19 fibrosis uh, the most important aspect will remain pulmonary rehabilitation and physiotherapy again role of pharmacotherapy is again inconclusive uh, but there may have been a role of steroids there are few studies but again they they have been single arm studies so one cannot be very sure whether the steroid has actually contributed to the improvement in this fibrosis or the patient would have improved on their own so again uh, the evidence regarding routine use of steroid in such patient is still lacking though we have an anecdotal reports of uh, improvement in such patients the most controversial of course anti fibrotics because the mechanism of action of most of these anti fibrotics and the mechanism of fibrosis in, in ards is again uh, there is slight mismatch in that so if every patient who have some sort of fibrosis will require anti fibrotic is again a matter of controversy and one should not be giving anti fibrotics to all patients who have some evidence of fibrosis on uh, uh, on any radiological evidence uh, in such patients other uh, treatment modalities like hyperbaric oxygen spironolactone mesenchymal stem cells again these are area of research so the most commonly used uh, treatment options so far for these patients include uh, nintadenib perfenidone hyperbaric oxygen and of course mesenchymal stem cells have a potential in such patients if we are able to prove that this is a progressive type of uh, fibrosis the airway complications in such patient include uh, uh, post covid bronchiectasis and uh, of course this is uh, and a complication which one may anticipate if we see more or and more uh, fibrosis uh, related complication in such patient these are usually traction bronchiectasis so literature in covid 19 sparse but uh, uh, they, they have been reported uh, from various studies from china exact burden is still unknown but this could lead to uh, uh, chronic cough and recurrent infection so uh, the management of post uh, covid bronchiectasis remains uh, the sim- same as we have uh, for other causes of bronchiectasis which is maintaining lung health and uh, infection prevention uh, with the vaccination and antibiotic prophylaxis and if uh, if we find the re- uh, reactive airway then bronchodilators may have some role pleural complication include pneumothorax and this can happen in patients who are in the icu setting because of the barotrauma of mechanical ventilation high flow uh, oxygen therapy pneumomediastinum may also be seen those patients who have been discharged uh, because of lung lung fibrosis they may develop cyst which may rupture and cause pneumothorax but again uh, we have to uh, uh, warn such patients uh, and uh, whatever uh, precautions they have to take we have to uh, inform them about that thing so uh, this uh, pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum should be suspected in cases with rapid worsening of respiratory status or new onset chest pain and it may occur at any time of the disease 
lung protective ventilation is probably the best preventive strategy and if a patient develop uh, this uh, sort of complications management uh, remains the same as for any other uh, reason leading to this pneumothorax anyway such patient should uh, the vigorous uh, sort of chest physiotherapy should be avoided in such patients uh, various cases of pneumothorax have been uh, reported across the globe and uh, whenever uh, the possibility of any risk factors are there they should be looked into Another important uh, complications of uh, COVID-19 uh, pertaining to lung include vascular complications and uh, pulmonary embolism is one of the most important uh, cause of morbidity and mortality in such patients. And it has been uh, reported that uh, almost 23 to 30% patients may have some sort of pulmonary embolism if uh, based on CT and geographic studies. The underlying mechanism include the endothelial dysfunction leading to inflammation and formation of microthrombosis, which may again disseminate intravascularly, leading to uh, this pulmonary embolism. Risk factors include obesity, severe disease, comorbidities, increased CRP and D-dimer levels. So we should, should suspect case of pulmonary embolism in those who have rapid worsening, ECG changes, unexplained tachycardia, and chest pain. All cases with pulmonary embolism should be screened for DVT. Late pulmonary embolism can also be seen and have been reported in small case series. Anticoagulation and thrombolysis when indicated remain the main preventive and therapeutic strategies. Even autopsy series have confirmed high incidence of pulmonary embolism and have ranged from 58% to almost 100% uh, in these uh, series. Preferred anticoagulant in, uh, includes low molecular weight heparin and the ideal prophylactic dosing strategy is uh, 0.5 milligram per kg uh, weight uh, in divided doses. Therapeutic dose should be used only in patients with established thromboembolism. Role of D-dimer in guiding anticoagulation strategy is still unknown and uh, we should not blindly just follow the D-dimer values while deciding on the treatment strategy. So the uh, anticoagulant uh, uh, consideration in critically ill patient uh, the American College of Chest Physicians have uh, advised prophylactic low doses of uh, low molecular weight heparin in critically ill patients. And in non-critically ill patients, again, prophylactic dose and other things we have to be, uh, that's not routinely advised unless uh, there is oxygen requirement. In non-hospitalized patients, of course, routine prophylaxis is not recommended. And uh, recommended uh, recommendation after discharge is again a matter of controversy and at the moment as things stand unless there is a risk factor we do not uh, recommend any extended prophylaxis after discharge post covid pulmonary hypertension again at uh, emerging topic and uh, mechanism include worsening myocardial uh, injuries or because of the hypercoagulable state leading to venous thromboembolism or presence of thrombotic uh, microangiopathy but conclusive evidence supporting PH as a consequence of COVID-19 is still lacking. A patient may have other coexisting pulmonary and cardiac uh, conditions because of which the pulmonary hypertension is unmasked in such patients. Uh, presence of PH is associated with poor outcomes and further studies should prospectively evaluate PH in these patients. So the various diagnostic modalities for such patients remain same as in case of any other cause of pulmonary hypertension. So these are various studies which have shown uh, that pulmonary hypertension at the time of uh, COVID-19. But again, the causative effect is still uh, something which needs further research. So uh, to follow these uh, patients who have recovered from COVID-19, of course, uh, a, a very perfect uh, strategy is yet to be uh, described. But again, depending on the uh, symptom of the patient at the time of discharge, one can decide when to call this patient. So we can call this patient usually at four weeks after discharge or based on SOS. And when the patient comes back, we have to uh, take into account uh, the routine assessment, the pulmonary functions and other uh, tests depending on the situation of the patient. Effort should be taken for prevention of infection in form of uh, COVID vaccination to prevent reinfection because reinfection may have a deleterious effect in such patients and other super added uh, infections. Parenchymal lung disease, depending on whether the patient is requiring uh, domiciliary oxygen, pulmonary rehabilitation, and role of antifibrotics remain controversial and should be used in a trial setting or in select a group of patients where they might benefit. Uh, patients who have bronchoctasis, again, avoidance of irritants and management of superadded infection plays an important role. Pulmonary hypertension, depending on the cause, underlying mechanism, one can decide what strategy needs to be followed. Pneumothorax will require uh, management as per uh, the standard protocol. So to take uh, 
take home message from this talk uh, this covid 19 caused by sars cov 2 can involve sequelae and other medical complications that can last weeks to months after initial recovery despite a host of other complications ards due to covid 19 continues to remain at the top uh, leading to morbidity and mortality in such patients the burden of fibrotic lung disease following sars cov 2 infection is likely to be high because of the sheer numbers involved uh, because of this disease long term follow up of large number of, of recovered patients involving uh, multidisciplinary team is necessary to understand the exact burden of complications role of anti fibrotics and extended anticoagulation should remain the research priority and covid 19 vaccination should be done even in recovered patient to prevent reinfection which may have a catastrophic effect in patients already suffering from these complications thank you thank you very much neeraj for a very comprehensive uh, uh, discussion on uh, or presentation on pulmonary co complications uh, which occur in covid with a focus on lung fibrosis uh we'll take uh, we'll take the questions in the end so we'll go on to the second topic presentation which is on the impact of vaccination on disease severity uh by dr jeremy brown dr arjun nair and and dr ema so over to the team at U ucl uh hi <clears throat> sorry it's professor brown here i'm just going to try and share my screen i will be hopefully this will work short quickly any success with that um can i ask if you're seeing my screen yes we are just enlarge it jeremy enlarge it okay i'll i'll convert it to a that's it perfect thank you you got it okay i can't see for some reason anyway um okay. right so no. we're actually going to talk about vaccines which clearly is not fibrosis of the lung after covid but the i think what the it previous on the others uh you'll need to sorry i can uh, interrupt uh, dr brown you'll need right. to go into powerpoint show on the ppt i actually can't see anything in zoom at all uh, right? you might need to toggle between your zoom screen and your uh, uh, yeah my zoom screen has disappeared for some reason uh screen sharing can you just you look at the right upper corner Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the rest of you. Oh. oh, can you? So we can see your emails and everything. Yeah. Oh, that's very exciting. So go back. <laughs> stop sharing a minute, and can we try be sharing it? Stop sharing. Okay. Let me just share. Let's select that. Oh, that's yeah, better. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. What happened the first time is um doesn't normally do that. Anyway. So what the previous talks have told us is that this disease is awful, essentially. You can get very severe acute infection, end up in intensive care, and you can end up with some damage which may persist. And essentially, the only way out of the situation will be vaccination. In the UK, we've had 125,000 deaths so far in two waves of infection. And without vaccination, we're going to get a third and a fourth wave with the requisite, you know, the the associated mortality and morbidity so vaccines have been developed very rapidly for SARS-CoV-2 what's been very interesting about the vaccines is two major things one is that the standard vaccine approaches using a live attenuated virus or an inactivated virus or a protein subunit from the virus is what most previous vaccines have used have not they're getting there they're, but they're not being introduced or used as yet and the vaccines that we've been using in the UK are both using novel platforms there's the RNA platform in the liposome and then there's the adenoviral vector and these have never been used previously in large vaccine programs previously so this is in itself a very interesting uh, and exciting development both the vaccines that we've been using in the UK which are the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca the Pfizer's the RNA and the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is an adenoviral a chimpanzee adenoviral vector they both use the spike protein which i'm sure everyone knows well about as the target so they they will induce an antibody to the spike protein which is a trimeric protein on the surface of co of SARS-CoV-2 and this antibody blocks interaction of the spike protein with the ACE2 inhibitor and prevents uptake by the cell. 
Both vaccines also induce T cell responses about little is known. And in a really remarkable period of time, they managed to produce vaccines which were effective, trial them in first, first of all, in phase one, phase two, and then in phase three trials. Here I'm showing the data, the, the Kappa-Meyer curves for two phase two, phase three trials, one with the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna, both of which are, are, are licensed for use in the UK, but Moderna hasn't arrived yet. And we've been, we've been using mainly Pfizer and the AstraZeneca. And the important thing about these Kappa-Meyer curves is to see that the second dose occurs about here and about here. And you can see on the subset for the Pfizer that the curves between the unvaccinated controls and the vaccinated controls, they actually diverge about day 10, 11. And the same for the Moderna, if you look at that in close detail. What this tells us is that the first dose of the vaccine is creating a high degree of protection. And the curve actually after day 10 or 11 is almost flat, not quite, but it's almost flat. And these trials, what a positive case is defined at is a patient presenting with symptoms and a PCR that's positive for SARS-CoV-2. Almost all of these patients are the ones that are treated in the community. So that's about 70, 80 percent of them will be relatively mild and not admitted to hospital. And there aren't really good data from the trials about severe disease, although what data there is shows that vaccination seems to almost completely prevent severe disease. Right. So uh, the UK's Vaccine um, Decision Making Committee, the Joint Committee of Vaccination Immunisation, which I've been a member of since 2018 and a member of the, the COVID subcommittee since last year. What, what this committee does is it suggests policy and the government uh, then decides whether to act on that policy. And there's two main things that we've did for the vaccine policy in the UK. One is we decided for the phase one vaccination priority categories. This was decided about autumn of last year, and it was based on preventing mortality. And essentially mortality is related to age. So we broke down age groups and suggested that we're going to vaccinate patients who are old, who live in care homes, first of all, because the mortality in that, in that environment is 20 to 30 percent. Then those over age, age 80, but we include the frontline healthcare workers in that category because of their exposure uh, and the need to make sure there are enough staff members able to do the work when the waves of infection occur. And then so on and so on down in five year categories. And if you see on the right hand side, this is the list of the number of people needed to be vaccinated to prevent one case of disease. So that varies from 10 in uh, care homes, which is just a phenomenally low number for uh, the need to prevent disease for a vaccine, down to about uh, around a thousand for those over 65 and so on and so on. So when you get below age of 50, you need to vaccinate about you know, 47,000, 45,000 people to prevent one death due to COVID-19. Not one admission. In fact, the need to, to vaccinate to prevent admission is much higher, it will be not as, nowhere near as high as 45,000. The other decision we made, and we made this at the very end of the last year, so in December, is that to maximize population protection, we would give one dose and delay the second dose of the vaccine for up to three months, which was very much against what Pfizer's recommendations were, which is to vaccinate their patient uh, with their vaccine three weeks after the first dose. And we did that because the amount of protection you got from one dose of vaccine was pretty good. It was like it was close to 80% of the total protective efficacy. And if you want to maximize the population protection, vaccinating two people to give them 80% of the vaccine efficacy is considerably better than vaccinating one person to give them 100% of the vaccine efficacy and one person not getting the vaccine. So that was the reason for that decision, which was remarkably controversial across the globe and within the, within the country as well. So what are the risks? Well, first off, the trials did not have anybody in significant numbers who we were targeting to vaccinate first. It was not, the trials were not in care home residents. They were not set in 80 year old patients. So we did not know that the people at the highest risk of disease were going to be protected by the vaccine. We can extrapolate from the data that's available and the immunological data in general suggested that the elderly had a reasonable immune response, which was a bit weaker, but still significant compared to young people to the vaccines. So we had to extrapolate from those data. 
The second was the idea of delaying the second dose. Well, we knew that the first dose was efficacious for a few weeks, but we did not know whether that efficacy was maintained up to six to 12 weeks later after the first dose. And if there was a rapid waning of the first dose immunity, then we could be in trouble. A third point is that uh, everything has been done at a, a high speed. And because the low risk population will need to be vaccinated, if we're gonna control this disease, and that's the people below age 50, the risk balance of the side effects from the vaccine for the benefit for each individual person under the age of 50 was not apparent. We did not know, did not have enough data on side effects to be absolutely clear that the vaccine would be safe enough to use in the under 50s. And if there are side effects become apparent as you roll the vaccine program out, then the idea of vaccination under the 50s becomes a real problem because then you're balancing the population needs versus the individual needs. However, the, we rolled out the vaccine and during this past couple of months, data has come through now, which is what I'm gonna talk about, which gives us some reassurance that the program will be successful. So the first data I'm gonna talk about is actually, uh, is a Lancet re, um, preprint and it's further analysis of the AstraZeneca trial where they followed patients who only had one dose of vaccine for a long period of time uh, and showed that the protective efficacy against symptomatic PCR positive disease was maintained. This is this, basically this line here, uh, even out to 112 days and three months is um, you know, around here somewhere. So extending the gap between one, uh, between the first dose and the second dose of 12 weeks, looks like that's going to be okay for the AstraZeneca vaccine at least. But this data only came out um, very recently. But we do have real life data now, vaccine instruction, and uh, both from the UK and Israel. These are the Israeli data, which again is in the New England Journal, and it shows the protective efficacy of one dose and two doses of the vaccine against basically PCR positive cases, PCR but symptomatic cases, those who are PCR positive end up in hospital, those who end up in hospital on CPAP or in intensive care, and those that die. And again, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves on the left-hand side for, for those categories. And you can see that there is very good efficacy with two doses of the vaccine, but reassuring for the UK, the first dose also had pretty good efficacy, especially in this bottom end here with a more severe disease with roughly 80% protection against hospitalization and severe disease in people only having one dose. So another important point, which I haven't shown the data for, but essentially this protective efficacy against hospitalization was the same for those age 70 as it was for those below 70 years of age. So that's very reassuring that the vaccine still works in a more elderly and more highly comorbid population, the ones most at risk of illness. So the best data we have from the UK about hospitalization comes from Scotland, which has a population of just under 6 million. And they have very good linkage of their healthcare records so they can work out who's been vaccinated and who's been hospitalized with COVID very rapidly. And their data show that in after one dose, the efficacy against hospitalization of both the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca is 85 to 90 odd percent. And that this is preserved in the 80 plus years of age. If this is who's been given the vaccine, you can see there is a big skew towards the right hand side due to the vaccine policy starting off of the age ranges and coming down. And it's 81%, even if you're 80 years of old. And these patients were had a lot of comorbidity and were relatively frail. So this is very good news from that point of view, that we can prevent hospitalization with one dose of the vaccine. And there are data coming through now for England itself, which are, are, are very similar. What has that, how's that affected the, 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 the pandemic? Well, this is the, the, the day, this sort of deaths versus time for the second wave and then for the first wave. And it's broken down into age groups. And this is the important age group to look at. This is the over 80s. These are the 70 to 80 year olds, 60 to 70 year olds, 50 to 60 year olds. And you can see this massive peak that occurs as the, 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 the second wave occurs over Christmas and January. But this peak has fallen very rapidly, faster than the younger age groups. This is the population that's been vaccinated, 
and the fall rate is minus 66% over this period of time. Whereas in the first wave, the rate of fall was half that as it has been this time. Now, it's difficult to know for sure what that, the reasons underlying that, but we do think that, that is, it relates to the vaccine efficacy, efficacy and helping very much with the tail end of the second wave to control the death rate in the population that has been vaccinated. And now the last set of data I'm going to talk about is the SIREN study. And this is something completely different. This is whether the vaccine can prevent infection and transmission. So the whole policy has been dictated on trying to prevent death. But with vaccines, the alternative is to try and prevent disease spreading between people and then indirectly preventing deaths by preventing transmission and infection occurring in the risk groups. But you can only do that if you know that the vaccine can prevent transmission and infection. Uh, asymptomatic or low-grade infection that allows the infection to spread between young people and from then to the high-risk groups later on. Um, there was no data from the trials which was supports that, or very little, little data. So the SIREN study is where they prospectively study symptomatic, uh, for symptomatic and asymptomatic infection by doing PCRs every two weeks in vaccinated and unvaccinated healthcare workers, essentially. And you can see here the odds ratio for getting a PCR positive infection after the first dose falls you know, after 14 days is what you expect. You don't expect any vaccine efficacy prior to, to 10 days or so. And it falls down to about you know, three cases maybe occurring for every vaccinated person compared to 10 in every unvaccinated person. So there's a good protected efficacy going on here. And the second dose bolsters that and makes that substantially better. So this does give us some feeling that vaccination of a population will reduce transmission and help bring down an R number by controlling infection. And these are very good data from that perspective. It allows us to think more broadly about the vaccine program. So summary of the real world data, we've had multiple vaccines introduced. Actually, it seems relatively easy to get a vaccine that protects against COVID-19, which is immensely good news for the world. And the real life data just show that one dose prevents the majority of severe infection, that it works in the very elderly and the frail. Two doses is more effective and it does look like vaccine will prevent transmission. And so the limiting success for our vaccine program is going to be coverage. We need to roll out this program and vaccinate as many people as possible, as quickly as possible and get the coverage as high as possible as soon as we can. Some questions. We don't actually have any idea how the vaccine works. I mean, I say that to be a little bit uh, provocative. We think it's probably the antibody binding to the anti-spike protein, but the issue about that is that the level of anti-spike protein antibodies is not that high after one dose. It goes up a lot after the second dose. It may be that you don't need too much antibody to protect, uh, but it may be there's other mechanisms going on, and we don't, at this point in time, know what the correlates of protection are, which is a problem going forward because it means you can't compare vaccines uh, without doing clinical trials, and they're not possible due to large numbers, especially as the disease comes under control, large numbers of people required. We don't know yet how long we will need uh, to wait before we have to, no, we don't know how long we can wait before we revaccinate. Is it six months, 12 months, two years, three years, five years? We just don't know. We don't know the efficacy of heterologous regimens of vaccines using the Pfizer first off and then, the, and then coming in with AstraZeneca or the Moderna as the second or the third dose. We don't really know any effect of the vaccine on our number and prevention of transmission as yet. And of course, the big question that everyone's worrying about is viral variants and whether they will lead to vaccine escape infection, which is a big, big issue and needs to be considered. And I'm very happy to take questions uh, and I'm grateful for AIMS for setting up this talk and allow me to share uh, our experience here in the UK on vaccines. Thank you very much, Professor Brown, for uh, really sharing your experience as far as vaccines is concerned. So we have a few minutes left and we can take some questions and uh, I'll start with the, the first question that I've got, which is basically, I'm combining two questions, and this is basically, I'm going to start by asking my Indian colleagues and then maybe uh, the uh, team from UK. The question says, what is the current role of antifibrotics versus steroids versus no treatment at all? <laughs> could, it have, could this just be a spontaneous resolution without any medication? And the reason why I'm asking my colleagues in India is because 
uh, both the antifibrotics, uh, profenadone and nintedanib, are very popular as far as post-COVID fibrosis is concerned. There are physicians who have start to start it very early with the belief that if you start it early in these patients, you can prevent fibrosis uh, from developing. And today I uh, had a discussion with a doctor in Mumbai uh, who, in, who had transferred a patient and this patient was on the sixth day of his illness. He had bilateral parenchymal infiltrates, COVID positive on HFNO. And the doctor in the, the GP or the, the doctor in the small nursing home had already started this patient on intedenib. So what is the role? And I'll start with Dr. Anand Mohan. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, the role of steroids and antifibrotics. The role of steroids, I think, is uh, not really in doubt. And that what we have believed right from the outset. Uh, and as we have seen right early on in the course of the pandemic, we have been using steroids quite uh, early on in the course of the disease for moderate to severe disease, of course. And, uh, and that somehow I, we do believe that that has helped in uh, not having the mortality going through the roof. So we have continued that throughout the course of the pandemic so far. And also one thing was the dose of the steroids and the duration of the steroids. So we used to give uh, dexamethasone 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kg per day, depending upon the severity. And we used to give it for at least seven to 10 days and sometimes even longer. So basically we were pretty flexible because we, there was no data at that point of time. And as of now, if we see even now, there are only four treatment options for uh, uh, COVID with any proven degree of efficacy. One is steroids, one is uh, proning, one is oxygen therapy, and one is the low molecular weight heparin. So steroid definitely has a role. As far as antifibrotics are concerned, uh, I think that debate is still going on. And, and we are not very convinced that antifibrotics very early on in the disease really should be the way forward because neither do we know much about it. And, uh, and we have seen that uh, over the next couple of weeks of the illness, most of the ground glass, most of the active disease and most of the fibrotic component as well also tends to resolve. And we have seen that in the couple of cases which were presented just now. Hence, uh, we feel it is prudent enough to wait for maybe two or at least three months at least or to have a patient who's progressively worsening with progressively deterioration in the fibrosis also. And then might, may be the time to start antifibrotics, but otherwise steroids really does the trick. Thank you. Neeraj, you want to add anything to that? Yes, sir. So most of the data which we have seen so far with published data, they have uh, mostly said that this type of fibrosis is usually not progressive and will either stay static and in most cases it's going to reverse on its own. So uh, whenever we have a suspicion that the patient may have a particular set, subset of ILD, underlying ILD uh, in this case, then one can think of that subset of patients may, might benefit from uh, this type of antifibrotic treatment. But yeah, starting antifibrotic for each and every patient who have slightest hint of uh, fibrotic changes on uh, radiological investigation is something which I think should be strongly uh, uh, discouraged. Dis discouraged, yeah, strongly discouraged, because this is something which we have been seeing in all the patients who have been coming to us with follow up who have been treated, and they have some sort of antifibrotic in their prescription, which I feel is uh, something we have to Correct. think again. So any comments from Professor Porter or Professor Brown or anyone uh, in the U UCL team? Professor Porter, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. Um, I absolutely agree with the comments. Um, uh, of my of my Indian colleagues. Um, I think one thing I would say is that because of the National Health Service in the UK, we haven't had access to antibiotic treatment. And actually, we might be really well placed to come together on this um, and share our experience at the end, because um, hopefully we will be able to, we can show you what happens without antibiotics and you will have cases with antibiotics. Okay, that's, um, Dr. Nair, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I was um, just very uh, wanted to agree with you. And, and as you said, Dr. Galeria, early on, I think labels and definitions and words matter. Uh, so I do not think we should be using the words fibrosis in the vast majority of these patients, especially because that terminology definitely emanates from the radiological reports or radiological interpretations. And as you've said, it's almost an oxymoron to say a reversible fibrosis uh, at the moment. Um, so I... I totally think that the vast majority of these cases we should just be interpreting as lung injury and lung injury in the vast majority of these cases will resolve and 
Um, that's why I think uh, we've got a lot of education to do for uh, radiology as well, to not overinterpret and see what we think we should be saying and seeing about these cases. I agree with that. That's why I, I keep arguing that we don't, we shouldn't use the term post-COVID lung fibrosis. It's not actually a fibrosis. It will resolve, give it some time. But we'll move on to the next question. And this is also related to steroids and anticoagulants. And this question, uh, actually there are two questions. The first question is, how long steroids and anticoagulants should be given in a person who has post-COVID sequelae? And the second question says, is if the patient improves, can we then taper off the steroids? So is there any uh, sort of uh, protocol that needs to be followed? And is that based on patient's improvement? Because some patients may improve within three months, others may take six to nine months. Anand, if you have anything to say on this, and then we can have uh, a response. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, the... the Patients who are still symptomatic and they have some kind of pulmonary sequelae may, may require and they do get a slightly prolonged course of steroids here. And uh, what we do is initially start with a higher dose and then gradually taper it over a period of, say, even a couple of weeks. So usually one to two weeks is maximum that we need to give. But if there are post-COVID sequelae, patient remaining symptomatic, we can even send him home otherwise with a tapering dose of steroids over the next couple of weeks and see. So in that way, we are pretty liberal, if you can say, with steroids with, the, of course, a check on the side effects. And uh, But again, most often than not, we have seen that symptoms improve. And as we have already seen, most of the post-COVID sequelae, pulmonary sequelae also improves. So up to two to three weeks, even up to four weeks, we have given the steroids uh, in almost in a significant proportion of the severe cases, if I may put it that way. So Professor Porter, what uh, protocol do you follow, follow for steroids in patients with post-COVID sequelae? You're muted. Sorry, sorry, yes. Uh, again, we are very much um, take it uh, on an individual basis, although actually more recently we have tried to put together a protocol so that we can be a bit more systematic um, with our approach. But, but certainly we use the lowest dose for the lowest period of time um, because many of these patients are obese, hypertensive, diabetic. Uh, so it is just a question of, of rationalizing a, a, a choice and considering the risks and the benefits. Okay, thank you. We'll go on to the next question. The next question actually um, is basically related to, again, the same thing, but asking is what is the role of antibiotic cover when you're giving steroid? And is there a role of Procal in trying to decide whether you should give antibiotics or not? Neeraj, we could, uh, maybe you could. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, usually what we have seen that whenever we start steroid, uh, because these patients have higher chances of getting super added infection, especially those admitted in ICU setting. So there is a tendency. And in fact, there have been papers where uh, it has been shown that, that uh, all these patients who are in ICU, most of them will receive one or the other broad spectrum antibiotic. So we uh, also have been following uh, somewhat uh, similar uh, strategy in our patients where whenever we have a sicker patient, moderate to severe patients where we have started steroids in patient, of course, then we usually cover a broad spectrum antibiotic as a coverage for any possible super added infection. So that in case if it's there, because proving infection in such patients in COVID settings sometimes become very difficult. So giving benefit of doubt, we have been using, uh, may, I may say liberal use of broad spectrum antibiotic in such patients. But once we discharge this patient on steroid, then we routinely do not advise any uh, prophylactic antibiotic uh, in such patients thinking that they might get infection. We just follow as we do in any uh, other indication of steroid in any other uh, situation, say in any autoimmune disorder. So we routinely do not prescribe uh, antibiotic at the time of discharge. Correct, okay. So maybe mm -hmm. Professor Brown, if you would like to say anything, what is, do you have an antibiotic policy for your COVID patients yeah. on steroids? <clears throat> I don't think it differs too much to what Niraj has just said. It, the trouble is, is that you've got somebody who's already got extensive lung shadowing, they're hypoxic, their C-reactive protein is often high and maintained at very high levels for a viral infection for a long period of time. And that basically obscures all our normal methods of identifying an infection as present. So essentially, we take a watch and see policy. If there's a change in oxygenation, a deterioration in the patient's condition, or a fever that has become, well, a new fever or a higher fever, uh, we have used procalcitonin to a certain extent because of the C-reactive protein issue, um, although we don't use it routinely or haven't used it enough to have a good, clear idea about it. 
really radiology is incredibly helpful because if, a sci- if you find some new shadowing, specifically if it shows uh, a denser consolidation in an area which is un- uninfected before, that would be immensely helpful. But of course, there's a lot of background shadowing making it incredibly difficult to be sure that something's new. So it, is, it isn't a science, it's very much an art deciding about infection. And we have seen aspergillus, which is a big issue when you've been on steroids for a long time. And, um, fortunately, there are markers for aspergillus, so galactomannin, um, and if somebody's intubated, you can bronch them to get a sample. So it's, it's complex and difficult. And I think with the, we have found with this second wave, the extensive use of steroids now in combination with anti-IL-6, this is a big issue. And um, it's, it's going to be, a, it's one of the real struggles that we have. So not horribly helpful. But that's where we are. Okay, thank you. I think you may at times have to take it on a case-to-case basis, if I put mm. it that way. Yes. Uh, one question for uh, Dr. Arjun Nair, and this is CTPA. When should it be done in these patients, and should we follow D-dimer, <laughs> or should we look at clinical profile? What would you advise? Um, so this was a question. I'm glad you asked this question, because this was a question we were asked uh, towards the start of January. Um, because from all the colleagues saying, how can we limit this uh, tsunami of uh, CTPAs coming through all our departments? Uh, And my short answer to that was you probably can't um, because everybody needs needs one when they are clinically deteriorating and the D-dimer, as we've seen, is maintains its uh, sensitivity, but is not specific in, in the slightest. Um, so what, what we basically, and also with our, in consultation with our hematologists uh, as part of the British Society of Thoracic Imaging, we issued a very short statement to say that the pathophysiology here is poorly understood. We've actually stopped using the term pulmonary embolus as, as, as well to make people understand that it's immunothrombosis uh, and vasculopathy really, uh, and there's no way of telling whether this is thrombus or embolus. And we, we all, what we emphasized was the first question to ask is, is it going to make a difference to management? And I know that sounds very patronizing, um, but actually the, the, the reason for asking that was basically because if we are unable to see a macro thrombus, so macro embolus, if you like, uh, within the large arteries, we would not be able to dis, uh, discount the fact that you know a smaller thrombosis, knowing the pathophysiology of this disease, uh, were occurring. So, in other words, if there was going to need to be an empirical decision to anticoagulate anyway, um, even if there was small smaller burdens of thrombus, uh, then then we perhaps would take the view that in combination with other in, uh, indices of pulmonary vascular or right vas- ventricular strain, that the CTPA would not add much. But the bottom line was it, it, we we've essentially done more this second wave than we ever did in the first wave, given what we knew. Uh, mostly, I'd have to say, probably for its negative predictive value for macrovascular pulmonary disease. Okay, I shall just ask you another question, which has just come in, and that is basically how frequently should we do a, a CT scan for following up or diagnosing pulmonary fibrosis, or will it work, or should one rely only on lung function testing? Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, don't ask uh, questions to which you don't want to know the answers of. Um, so, <laughs> so which, by which I mean, don't do CTs if you don't think it's going, if, you know, the patient looks like is that they're actually improving and you feel that actually that, that improvement is all you need to, to base the clinical uh, judgment on, then I think we've been taking a more conservative, I love for Joe and uh, Jerry and Emma's um, uh, comments on this because we've been taking a more conservative view than we did earlier on as well. Um, so I would say, you know, now we think actually if, there's, if the patient has been progressing in the right, right way, perhaps, uh, you know, a baseline CT, um, and by which I mean something to tell us how they are just after this acute episode around, uh, our, our recommendations currently are between six weeks and three months. I think most people are going for three months now, and then a later period, probably even six to nine months. Um, but Joe and Emma, would you agree with that? No, absolutely. That, that's absolutely right. And, and sometimes it's very reassuring. For example, the second case that Emma presented, we, we probably will do a CT at a year just to see what we're left with out of interest because it's a new disease. And I think we, we need to know what happens to these patients. Okay, thank you. What what are we doing, Anand? You could give us a little bit of an update on that. Yeah. So so here, what what we do is, and again, all the patients who have a pulmonary respiratory dysfunction at the time of discharge, they obviously have one baseline CT at the time of admission, and if they are if there is a long gap, so we try and see not to club two CTs too close together. That is one. Uh, 
and then the next CT scan would be probably again uh, somewhere between two to three months after the, the uh, hospital discharge or after the first baseline CT. Again, that will be done only if the patient is not seemingly improving or if he's deteriorating. Otherwise, if he's really done well and if he improves, then we do a pulmonary function test and that you know if that shows reasonably okay if his performance status is okay we do not repeat a ct scan in every patient so we do that only when we we feel the initial ct was extremely bad that is one or if the patient is not improving clinically that is the the second uh, uh, option okay thank you before i take on the questions which have come as far as the vaccination is concerned there are just two more questions and i don't think uh, let's see if anyone can give some sort of an answer one is uh, is there any role for treating gastroesophageal reflux disease for preventing pulmonary fibrosis? So, uh, Professor Porter, do you have anything to say on that? And maybe I'll ask Neeraj if he has anything to say. I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I, and it's not really something um, we, of course, consider it in our outpatients, but I don't think, I'm not aware that we really think about that um, in our inpatients. So, but I will now. So that's a brilliant question. Thank you. <laughs> I, think, I don't think we have enough data. It's something that we need to answer. It's a good research question that one can look at. That does GERD play a role as far as pulmonary fibrosis is concerned? And the second question, which also I think is a tough one, are there markers to predict which patient will go on to develop pulmonary fibrosis as compared to who will not? And uh, uh, Professor Porter or Professor Brown, if you would like to say if you have anything to say, or Neeraj, if you would like to put any, uh, have any answer to that question. I think anything I say will be entirely speculative and, and drawn from correlations with what we know about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So there are one of the things that um, this big longitudinal study in the UK is looking at is some of those biomarkers. So in particular, biomarkers of collagen breakdown, epitope uh, production, what we call the, the Nordic biomarkers. Uh, we're also going to be looking at biomarkers of vascular injury and um, uh, epithelial injury such as the ones that have been shown to be partially useful in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So, so I think it's something that there's a lot of interest in, whether we can predict who's going to get pulmonary fibrosis and what the biomarkers are. Uh, but at the moment, um, we're, we're just collecting data. And we've also got an interesting program looking at uh, FDG PET imaging, but also novel uh, FAPI PET imaging in, in, to see if we can predict patients who may go on to develop pulmonary fibrosis. Again, I think that's a really rich area for research and it'd be, it'd be wonderful if we could sort of collaborate with that in some way um, with you. Yeah, I think so. I think this is another good question which uh, raises a lot of uh, sort of areas for research. Either you want yeah. to so, so there have been few patient related uh, uh, comorbidities which have been associated with uh, high chances of developing uh, pulmonary fibrosis which has been described including pre-existing lung, uh, lung dysfunction for, due to any reason or those patients who have prolonged ventilatory uh, requirement in ICU setting. And apart from that, of course, people have tried to find out various biomarkers, including the role of the uh, patients uh, having lymphopenia or lymphocytosis at the time of presentation, raised CRP levels, which is again a marker of intense uh, inflammatory response of the body, or raised D-dimer. So again, these all are speculative, and uh, we will require further research to pinpoint what exactly, how we can predict it. Mm. Thank you very much. We've actually extended our time. So we'll take just a few questions as far as the vaccine is concerned. Uh, the first question is uh, for Professor Brown that uh, what are the chances by, that by delaying the second uh, dose, we may develop, uh, allow, the, uh, allow an immune escape mechanism and uh, development of a resistant or, or a variant which may not, uh, for which the vaccine may not be effective? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is a point. This has been raised as a reason why people are worried about the delay of the second dose. You have to bear in mind that our vaccine was introduced when what I call the Kent variant, the UK variant, which is more transmissible, was prevalent. So all the data from the UK is actually of efficacy again in real the real world data is against one of the variants. It's against the Kent variant because that was that's caused eighty percent of the problems in the in this last wave. So um, I think maybe, in a, well, first of all, the second dose improves the immune response. You get a much better antibody response if you have a delayed second dose uh, 
than the first dose. So what we're talking about is that gap between the first and second dose, whether that will allow a viral escape mutant that is partially immune to the vaccine that can only be overcome by a second increase in the anti-spike protein antibody or the T-cell responses. And that is a theoretical risk. It has not come to pass. That's the bottom line. All right. It's a, uh, and when we're basic with a theoretical risk versus the situation we were in with a, an absolute horrendous wave of infection, killing thousands of people and the need to vaccinate people as quickly as possible, there's basically no contest. We delay the second dose to maximize how many people get the first dose. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. There's another thought provoking or, or provo provocative question, if I put it that way. <laughs> Do you really need the second dose? And is it more being promoted by the industry rather than by science? Your your answer to that. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, uh, <laughs> um, and there is a there is a vaccine out there that is a one dose vaccine as well. So you know it's a it's a, actually a very personal question um, because obviously if you only need one dose, then you can vaccinate twice as many people across the globe. And yeah, I talk about the UK. We need to vaccinate the whole world. You know, so there's there's there, there's a it's an important issue. Um, what it comes down to is that the first dose establishes protection during what you might call this acute COVID pandemic phase in our population and gives us some degree of protection against a third wave causing what the first, second and the first wave caused. What the second dose does is that it boosts those immune responses quite markedly. You know, we're talking two to three fold. And that we would hope would extend the period of immunity. So it lengthens the immune period. And I don't think COVID-19 is going to go away. I know New Zealand have gone for eradication policy, but they're now sitting there in New Zealand, isolated from the rest of the world. And until they vaccinate their population, they can't open up. You know, this vaccination is the only way out of this situation because this it's going to be coming back otherwise. So having a long duration of protection would be a good thing. So that's what the second dose is for. Thank you. So we just, we'll just take two more questions. I'll combine one of them with the other, or maybe three then. Uh, one question is, uh, for a patient who's recovered from COVID-19, so that could the, the disease itself could be the prime part, do you need only one dose, or do you then also need to take two doses? That's the first question. Uh, because there, are, there is some data which is coming up that after in recovered patients who recovered from COVID-19, if you take one dose of the vaccine, your antibody response is very good and you, it's like the booster dose uh, of the, or the second dose that is there. And the second question, which is how long after recovery should you get vaccinated? And should you look at antibodies titers to decide whether you should get vaccinated if you have recovered from COVID-19? Okay, so I'll take the second one first because the, the policy is you wait one month after your COVID PCR positive for your vaccination. And, and in actually, you don't have, I guess we chose one month because at the time there's high rates of infection. Uh, as the rate of infection goes down, you, know, you can be a bit more relaxed about that. And there are potentially benefits because it probably boosts your immune response if you delay a little bit after that month. But at the moment, the policy is one month and then you can have the vaccine. The first question, yes, actually having COVID is like having one dose of the vaccine. They're very similar in the antibody levels you get and the protective efficacy against reinfection. So indeed, you could have a policy where people who've previously had COVID uh, only need one more dose of the vaccine and then they will be fully protected. And I think some countries have adopted that. Uh, we have not, mainly because testing everybody before you give them the vaccine is a bit of a pain and it will cost a lot of money. So uh, we haven't applied that. And when it comes to vaccine supply, we're, we're, we're not constrained in the UK. We have enough to vaccinate everybody three times. So we don't need to think about preserving vaccine within the UK. I know that's a somewhat selfish attitude from the United Kingdom, but that's, that's, the, that's the reality is where we're basing our decisions from. Okay, thank you very much. We've really run out of time. Actually, we've crossed our time. So before I end, I'm going to ask uh, all the panelists to, uh, to give some sort of a take-home message to our audience. And then I'll ask uh, Professor Monica Lakhanpal for a concluding uh, remarks. So I'll start with uh, uh, 
Professor Je Jeremy Brown, what would be your take home message for the audience? I mean, roll out a vaccine program. And uh, I realize that's easy for a small country of 60 million people. And it's a big issue when your population is measured in billion. Um, but that's what's necessary. Thank you. Professor Porter, what would you like to really tell the audience? So early and appropriate use of steroids when you see a, a fibrotic organizing pneumonia may um, improve uh, speed of recovery and may prevent fibrosis, but we're still awaiting full data on that. Dr. Nair, what would you like to say as a radiologist? <laughs> Uh, my, uh, as usual, I think it's just about not uh, overcalling fibrosis, especially in those early acute or uh, subacute uh, scans, um, and uh, um, and to and to to promote the idea that we need more research to work out which features will identify potentially those patients that will go on to develop true fibrosis versus those that will resolve. Thank you, Dr. Ima. Would you like to say anything considering you're doing research on this area? Um, well, I echo what Professor Porter said, really. Timing of steroids is absolutely crucial. Um, getting in there early, there is probably a time window that's important. Um, and as you probably reach a point where it's essentially a bit too late to give them. So getting in early and timing is really important. Thank you. Neeraj, would you like to say something? Ah, yes, sir. So once uh, antifibrotic should be judiciously used, should not be indiscriminately used. And the second thing, many people ask whether uh, if I have got a COVID infection already, should I get myself vaccinated? So at the moment, since we don't have any evidence, so giving benefit of doubt, uh, I think everybody should get vaccinated because reinfection, especially in those who had some sort of complications, especially lung complication, in such patient reinfection can have a further catastrophic effect. So everyone, irrespective of whether they have been infected or not, uh, as per current evidence, everybody should get vaccinated. That is very important. Thank you. Dr. Anand, okay. uh, well, I'll uh, talk about the, the lung uh, component here. That is one that uh, after the acute phase is over, I think um, every patient should be followed up uh, properly for any sequelae because long-term sequelae, although rare, if they are there, they can be very, very debilitating to the patient. Remember, then he becomes an ILD and he goes home on long-term oxygen therapy. So although we must not be very hasty in prescribing antifibrotics upfront, not at all, but a careful follow-up is required, maybe by spirometry and other measures, simple measures of exercise mm -hmm. tolerance. And based on that, an appropriate decision of whether to extend steroids or whether to start antifibrotics should be taken at the right, uh, uh, at the time, right time frame. Thank you. Before I conclude, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Monica Lakhanpal to give her comments. Thank you very much. And, and just what a fas fascinating conversation that we've just had. I've learned so much myself, which I haven't learned for the last year, probably. So I know all about fibrosis, the language to use, the language not to use. Never ask a test you don't want to have the answer for is one thing I've, I've learned. Um, you know, be careful what you ask for, really. Um, I wanted to particularly thank Professor Tiwari, Professor Mohan and, and Professor Nishal. We've just learned so much. And I think what we really learned is mm. how we need to come together, share information, learn. I mean, um, Professor Galeri, you know, your, your example of the steroid um, example that you gave from personal communications. Um, I think, you know, we have to realize this is a, we're in this for the long run. And actually the more information we can get and share we, with each other, the more we'll collectively make a difference to the, the people we serve. Um, so I think these grand rounds are an amazing way of doing that, of bringing these questions and making us think. I mean, Joe's already talked about new research questions. So um, finding funding, doing research together, collectively making a difference. Um, and just to finish, I'd also like to thank Professor Galeria and Professor Rajiv Kumar, who have organized these events and invited us. And Amit Kandawal as well, you know, my partner in crime, who always does a lot of work in the background to help us to come to these meetings and, and enable them to happen um, together. So thank you for everybody really. And um, I look forward to an, another time together in the near future. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity from the All Institute of Medical Sciences to thank the entire team at University College London for uh, coming together for this national grand round on COVID-19. I think it was a, a really a learning experience for all of us, whether it be the timing of steroids, the role of antifibrotics, or whether to actually call COVID fibrosis fibrosis or not. And whatever looks like fibrosis on CT is not fibrosis, it's reversible. And the challenges of vaccination and the issue that we have to really work aggressively to vaccinate everybody
if you really want to get out of this pandemic i think that is a very very important message that we need and it's uh, i personally feel that we have to come over even what we call vaccine nationalism and look at vaccinating everyone mm. rather than looking at it at regional areas because uh, as we've seen with the emergence of these variants whether it be south africa brazil or uk unless you vaccinate everyone you will continue to get variants which will travel across the globe and cause more and more uh, cases with uh, problems even as far as vaccination is concerned so i think we should continue to have our interactive sessions it also helps in raising research questions and we really need to take that forward in uh, developing research protocols getting the funding and and therefore being able to answer these questions there were some very good questions which came up and which actually uh, sort of uh, raised research ideas hopefully we can take this forward and build on um, research which would def- which would be, therefore help as far as patient care is concerned thank you very much and i look forward to meeting you again in another uh, grand round thank you thank you thank you thank you so thank you. much